It's done. China and Russia's partnership confirmed, and they are planning this. Russia's relations with the West may be strained, but in the East they are flourishing. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi reaffirmed his nation's stance on the conflict in Ukraine and hinted that China and Russia would strengthen their ties in the upcoming year. Wang also blamed America for the deterioration of relations between the world's two largest economies. China claims that it has firmly rejected the U.S. erroneous China policy, and Wang was speaking via video to a conference in the Chinese capital. Is China forced to pick between allies? What is China's response to the request from European authorities to condemn Russia's incursion? What are the future plans now that the relationship has been confirmed? Are the U.S. and E.U. concerned about the alliance between China and Russia? In any case, they are not shocked by this collaboration. They have been waiting for this ever since Putin visited Beijing for the Winter Olympics. We'll talk about why, despite the fact that China's economic future still depends on American and European markets and technology, China decided to support Russia. Wang declared that China and Russia would deepen strategic mutual trust and mutual beneficial cooperation. According to an official transcript of his statements, he added, With regard to the Ukraine crisis, we have continuously kept the fundamental values of objectivity and impartiality without supporting one side or another, adding gasoline to the fire, much less seeking self-profits from the situation. Although Wang admitted that history has demonstrated that China and the United States cannot decouple or sever supply networks, leader Xi Jinping is pushing for Chinese industry to become more self-sufficient. He asserted that this was because the United States has steadfastly continued in considering China as its major competitor in engaging in open blockade, oppression, and provocation against China. In its relations with the U.S., China would seek to right the ship. Fu Kong recognized that the Ukrainian crisis is becoming a concern for our bilateral relations with the EU, even though Beijing doesn't feel like it should be much of an issue or much of a problem. In Fu Kong's first in-person interview since becoming the Chinese ambassador to the European Union, he said this, Fu occupied a job that had been open for almost a year, a time when Russian aggression and China's close connections to Moscow came to dominate bilateral relations. European officials have asked that China condemn Russia's incursion and use its influence to help put an end to the conflict. Fu said one of his aims in his new position was to depoliticize relations between the EU and China. He referred to the fight as a so-called special operation since this is what the Russians have dubbed it. He reminded the Europeans that China has appealed for peaceful resolution since February 25th, the day the invasion began. On the second day after the operation began, and Chinese President Xi had a crucial phone conversation in which President Xi vehemently defended the need to attempt to find a peaceful solution. People usually forget that, Fu said. He claimed that China had no incentive to continue the war and was not gaining anything from it. We consider ourselves to be, if you will, collateral damage from that catastrophe. We don't want to pick between friends because Russia and Ukraine are both good allies. That is the foundation of China's position, according to Fu. Since the Russian President Vladimir Putin's invasion on February 24th, Europe has closely scrutinized China's connections with Russia. Putin was the star guest at the Winter Olympics in Beijing. In a joint statement, he and Chinese President Xi Jinping declared that there were no restrictions in the Sino russian collaboration and no taboo zones. Since then, the context and the wording of that comment have come under scrutiny. Not to read too much into the language of the deal, Fu urged Europeans. He argued that China has comparable alliances with numerous other nations and does not impose artificial limits on its bilateral ties. The No Boundaries Pact with Moscow is still a topic of discussion for Europeans. However, he claimed that after 10 months of Chinese officials regularly expressing support for a peaceful solution, he was somewhat uncomfortable about this. How could you get that deal so soon from the start of the crisis? I can see that the European nations quickly responded. He stated that the crisis had already begun, but 10 months later, the facts demonstrate that China is not giving Russia military support. You must recognize that our stance have been quite balanced. 
and we are prepared to participate in any efforts towards peace. However, Fu claimed that by supplying guns and benefiting from Europe's energy crisis, the United States was profiting from this calamity. We are aware that certain people are making money off this catastrophe. They are selling a sizable number of weapons. We also know who is profiting from the energy crisis that the European countries have suffered, but with regard to the knockoff impacts of that crisis. We will support all efforts in this regard, but the most crucial thing is to put an end to the violence and secure a ceasefire in order to save lives. We are aware that some countries or individuals with certain countries do not want to see the hostilities end, and we do not believe that is correct," Fu stated. When asked if he thought the U.S. did not want the war to end, Vu replied, that is our view. Requests for comment from the U.S. government were not answered. Fu gave an example of the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. When asked why Beijing does not open its own markets to European corporations in exchange, Beijing cites a stagnant agreement with the EU that would have opened several areas of the Chinese economy. Why shouldn't the Europeans ratify the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment if they were so worried about the market access in China? We're prepared to expand on that, adding that China would continue to open up, as seen by the recent Communist Party national meeting. That was a crucial first step, Fu stated. Last year, the CAI was halted by tit-for-tat sanctions that were initially imposed by the EU due to Beijing's alleged violations of the human rights of the Uyghur minorities in Xinjiang. Fu denied that there were any issues with human rights in the area and claimed that the justification for the EU's sanctions were based on a lot of misinformation, some of them downright lies and fabrications. Then, Beijing placed retaliatory penalties on diplomats, academics, and parliamentarians from the EU. Beijing would lift them. We are prepared to put the past behind us. How about removing the sanctions all at once, he said. Nabila Masrali, foreign policy spokesperson for the EU, stated that we never comment on the decision-making process on sanctions. Because of your difference on China with some particular human rights issues, are you willing to abandon a sizable market like China? We will continue to call on China to follow its national and international duties and to respect human rights, she added. All decisions about sanctions are adopted by member states in the Council, and the Council's adoption of subs revolutions is by an enemy. Russian President Vladimir Putin presided over the opening of the significant new Siberian gas field in order to support a planned increase in supplies in China. The Power of Siberia pipeline, which transports Russian gas to China, will receive feedstock from the Koisova gas field. It is the largest in eastern Russia, with 1.8 trillion cubic meters of recoverable reserves. As a result of the conflict in Ukraine, the European Union is reducing its reliance on Russian energy. Therefore, the launch is a part of Russia's effort to shift gas exports to the east. As an important event for Russia's oil sector and overall economy, Putin praised it. The power of the Siberia pipeline, which began supplying roughly 10 billion cubic meters of gas to China towards the end of 2019 and is expected to reach its maximum capacity of 38 billion cubic meters in 2025, was used to transport natural gas from Russia to China. Beijing's third largest gas supplier is now Russia. Putin and Chinese officials signed an agreement in February to sell 10 billion cubic meters more of gas to China from Russia's Far East via a new, more compact pipeline running through China's Northeast. Russia also intends to build a Power of Siberia 2, a significant pipeline that will pass through Mongolia with a view of selling an additional 50 million cubic meters of gas annually. The projects, according to Putin, will enable Russia to increase its gas sales to China to 48 billion cubic meters by the year 2025 and to 88 billion cubic meters by 2030. Dmitry Medvedev, the former leader of Russia, paid an unexpected visit to China, and he met with President Xi Jinping. Medvedev claimed that they covered no limits strategic relationship and that the two nations proclaimed in February. For Xi Jinping, this is newly improved, developing relationship with Moscow is delicate. For a few decades, the relationship hasn't always been cordial. However, he and other Communist Party leaders can now assist Moscow more 
And Vladimir Putin is aware that he can rely more and more on China, the world's second largest economy. Do you think China is taking the wrong position? Or is China's position fairly neutral? Are they prepared to work towards peace in any way? Comment below. Please like the video and subscribe for more about the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And thanks for watching.